as promised. I'm Jane Henniger, I'm the Executive Director of the ACLU of, of Indiana, very lucky and honored to be so. So as some of you may know, this is our 60th anniversary of the ACLU of Indiana, part of the ACLU National, which is over 90 years old. Like a fine line, we're getting better all the time. <laughs> this whole year we're having special programming such as um, our events tonight. And um, I've been looking forward all year to this program, uh, our um, special first time ever serving wine in the evening, <laughs> first Wednesday, and, um, and especially doing it on the Art of, uh, of as Descent in the spirit of Ai Weiwei. Those of you who've seen the exhibit know that um, like those of us at the ACLU are supporters of our members, Ai Weiwei is a civil libertarian. He is challenging his government, some would say provoking his government, to do the right thing. He, um, he's so prolific, he seems to be, do it every day, and so do we. So um, I want to thank the IMA and Preston Batista for being such willing and gracious partners in tonight's event. I want to thank our 60th anniversary sponsors who stepped up and helped make our whole year of programming possible, which they include Cass and Corn, Barnes and Thornburg, and Hooper Hall. You have an awesome panel, and I want to thank them. And I don't want to take another minute away from the wonderful conversation they're about to to have. So um, I want to thank you all, last of all, for being here. I want to thank you for uh, supporting and encouraging our work, participating in our work. If you're a member, thank you for that. And if you're not a member, there's always time. <laughs> so, Preston, um, yes, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Preston Bautista. I'm uh, the Deputy Director for Public Programs and Audience Engagement here at the IMA. Um, I'd, I'll start by saying thank you to Jane and to Kelly Sharp for giving us this great opportunity to partner with them on this program. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And as Jane said, the first ever ACLU First Wednesdays at the IMA, hopefully the beginning of many others. Um, and just briefly about uh, this program and about Ai Weiwei, uh, because of the artist and the nature of his work, um, this exhibition has sort of given us this tremendous opportunity to partner uh, with several um, local groups, including the Heartland Film Festival, who co-presented Never Story with us, uh, the screening of the movie. And last Friday, for Final Fridays, um, the band, a band called the Kaminas, a Desi Pakistani punk rock band who thought that it would be great to perform here at the IMA uh, while this exhibition was going on. So these groups have found in the artists really, um, you know, a source of inspiration or an eloquent spokesperson, if you will. Uh, I think in part because this work addresses some, you know, the most challenging issues uh, that we face today. So. I'm thrilled that we're able to host this forum tonight because I believe this discussion will also illustrate how art, and especially the visual arts, can serve as a stimulus for conversation about some of the work, important issues that are also at the core of ACLU's work, and in this case, the freedom to express oneself. So thank you again for coming, and um, just a little plug here, I hope you'll join us on June 27th for a screening of Ai Weiwei's fairy tales. And if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, it's um, up till July 21st. So now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of tonight's program. Please uh, welcome Brandon Judkins, the Director of Programs at Indiana Humanities. Well, thanks to Jane and thanks to Preston. I think tonight's gonna be a, a great conversation and I'm really flattered to be a part of it. However, if you guys are going to have a good time and anybody's going to learn anything, I'm the person you're going to hear the least from up here on the stage tonight. So uh, let me get to the folks that actually matter up here with me. Uh, to the far left, and I'm going to put this down. I'm, I'm better without a mic. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, okay. 
Sorry, I'm back on the mic. Um, so to the far left, I have Rachel Heisinga. Recently. Rachel is the uh, Assistant Director of Interpretation at the IMA, and more importantly for tonight's purpose, uh, Rachel is a self-described obsessive reader of all things Ai Weiwei. Uh, next to Rachel, we have LaShonda Crowstorm. LaShonda is an amazing art artist. She's also an amazing social worker, community builder, and she happens to be a farmer. Um, I think Rachel, well first, Rachel's the creator of those breathtaking, or the breathtaking quilt that's outside the room tonight. I'm so <laughs> sorry, LaShonda is the creator of the breathtaking quilt outside. Um, See, I told you, you, you do not want to hear from me tonight. I'm just a conduit. Um, I think LaShonda is going to be able to give us some really interesting insight into the process of creating art that challenges and the challenges of bringing that art to the public. Uh, and then next to me, we have Ken Falk. Ken's the legal director at the ACLU of Indiana, uh, and I think you would be challenged to find anybody more committed to principles of social justice and civil liberty. Uh, Ken's had a 35-plus year legal career here, and he's really had two jobs. The first half of his career, he spent providing free legal services to low-income Hoosiers, and the second half, he spent um, protecting and expanding civil liberties with the ACLU. So I think we've got a great group to help us put this all in context tonight. Um, the title of tonight's event is Artist Dissent and the Spirit of Ai Weiwei. And as I thought about how to frame this conversation before I threw the ball over, I came across this quote from Jane, and I thought it summarized where we were going with this better than anything I would come with. So I, I thought I would start there. And Jane said on Ai Weiwei's work, any government, whether it's China or Europe or the United States of America, must be reminded and prodded, and reminded and prodded again, that it may not value order at the undue expense of liberty. It's the nature of governments to wobble over that line, and it's the nature of artists and other civil libertarians to prod them back into balance. So with that, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Ai Weiwei and his work. We're going to talk about how that translates to the American experience. We're going to talk a little bit about creating art that forces thought. And at the end, we're going to talk about whatever you guys want. Um, so I thought we'd start with Rachel to maybe give us a little background on Ai Weiwei and his work. And it would be impossible in the short time we have here to have a comprehensive overview, but there are a few projects that I'd, I'd like her to hit on. And I'm going to start with, there's a, a series of works that are featured pretty prominently in this exhibit. And on the surface and at first blush seem to really focus on what initially seems like a lack of respect for the work of other artists. Um, so I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit about that series of work. I'll do my best. Um, okay, so um, Ai Weiwei produced a series of work um, that began shortly after he returned to China after a number of years in New York. And he was really um, shocked at um, how much cultural change was happening in China. Um, and uh, one evidence of, of this was um, a lot of um, fake um, vases from various periods in Chinese history, um, very, very, very old antiquities um, that were, uh, there were fakes, and then uh, he thought of, of them as a symbol um, for the change that was happening in China. So in this really provocative series of photographs, he is dropping a Han Dynasty urn, that's the title, and, you know, um, um, as a museum person, I have mixed feelings. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, um, yeah, there's a, there's a little shiver that goes up the spine. But um, he's also really making a statement about the kind of destruction that is happening in China to make room for modernity. Um, there's a lot of um, destruction that, that happens in the wake of that. Um, this is one of his earliest of that series. Um, a really interesting overlay of American culture, branding, marketing um, on this. Uh, that, that's the oldest one. That one is Neolithic. Awesome. 
This is a series of um, vases. Uh, these ones are also Han Dynasty that he uh, dipped in industrial paint. And again, it's you know a, a layer of of new culture um, uh, that is still revealing the form of of an of a, an historic one. Both of these two, uh, this one is called grapes. It's made from stools that came out of temples. Um, again, it's a repurposing of, of a traditional object. And this is map of China, and it's made from um, uh, beams that came out of old temples. Um, it's a monumental work, um, really worth seeing up in the gallery. And, and I'll have to stop you. I mean, describe a little bit for people who haven't seen it, kind of the physical presence of of that piece, because as you look at the, the image, it looks like it could sit on this coffee table really nicely, but. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a very deliberately uh, selected height. Um, for the average person, it's, it's just too tall to be able to get a decent view of it. Um, you kind of want to put your camera in the air and see the, for, you know, if you can get the best shot that you can. Uh, the average person could never see it that way. So it's sort of a statement, um, or it couldn't be seen as a statement about um, how vast China is and how difficult it is to sort of get a broad context. Well, let me, th this image is a great segue. And I think uh, as I kind of think of some of this work in groups, it's interesting to start with the Han Dynasty vases and maybe jump forward 2,000 years. Um, Ai Weiwei has been really prolific in his commentary about the Chinese people and the Chinese government's interaction with the internet. And there are lots of interesting pieces on that. But I think this piece, the crabs, is the most fun one for me and the most entertaining and interesting. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about kind of the subtext of what this piece is and talk a little bit about how this piece came to be. Sure. Um, OK, so in uh, November of 2010, um, Ai Weiwei uh, put out a notice on Twitter that he was going to hold a party um, at uh, the Shanghai studio that he had just built. Um, he's an architect as well. So um, he had been specifically invited to design and, and create this um, new studio. And not long after it was completed, um, the Chinese government told him that it would be demolished. Um, there are some things about the relationship between Ai Weiwei and the Chinese government that we'll get to. Um, but, uh, you know, suffice it to say, it wasn't just about codes. Um, so, um, anyway, Ai Weiwei held this huge party um, to celebrate or mark the, the end of, of the short-lived life of the studio. And um, he wasn't actually able to attend. Um, because he was under house arrest. But nonetheless, people came, and uh, they served um, uh, 10,000 river crabs. Uh, river crabs um, are pronounced, um, I'm going to try. I'm just going to try. Um, hua shi. And that is, uh, the pronunciation of that word is just the same as um, uh, for the Chinese word for harmonious. And harmonious is the term that is often used to um, sort of, uh, or, or of the value that is used to justify censorship. Um, and so it was, it was a direct statement um, by Ai Weiwei about, um, the, uh, about the censorship that, that he was facing online at the time. His blog was being taken down and put up again and taken down. And um, anyway, the party went on and uh, he wasn't there, but everyone in attendance documented it um, for him online. <laughs> so, you sort of alluded to his interaction with the Chinese government, and as I see this sort of escalation in his provocation with the Chinese government, I think that one really strong catalyzing event is the, the 2008 Sichuan earthquakes, where it, it seems that his work seems to shift more directly towards activism. And so maybe talk a little bit about 
his reaction to the 2008 Szechuan earthquake and some of the work that came out of that, because I think that sets a really interesting stage for his interaction with the, with the government. Sure. Um, so, um, shortly after the earthquake, Ai Weiwei um, went to the region and documented it, and he was so, so saddened um, by the devastation there. Um, he took a lot of photographs, and he later said that he just couldn't bring himself to um, uh, communicate about it online for a number of days, because it was just sort of too much to absorb. Um, uh, but eventually uh, he started to ask questions and, and one of the worst things about that earthquake was that um, amid all of the destruction, the worst of it happened to be school buildings, which were apparently constructed really poorly. Um, and so they were just utterly demolished and, um, and it was clear that, in, that many children had died. Um, and Ai Weiwei was one of the first people who um, tried to seek out information about um, who had died in the earthquake, um, but got nowhere with it. Um, so he and a number of volunteers got together and they went to the region and talked to families and gathered data um, and eventually created um, a list of 5,212 children who died. Um, that uh, list he posted online a year after the earthquake, so that was, um, yeah, well, a year after the earthquake, May 2009. And it, it, the immediate effect was that his um, blog was taken offline. Um, and that um, felt like a provocation, I think, for Ai Weiwei. And um, uh, shortly after that, he, he went to Chengdu to um, be present for the trial of another activist who had been researching the earthquake. His name was Tan Zorin. They hadn't met each other, but he wanted to be there to support him. Um, while there, Ai Weiwei uh, was um, in a hotel room and uh, waiting for the trial the next day and police broke into his hotel at three in the morning and um, he was beaten on the head and was held in the hotel for 12 hours so he wasn't present for the trial. Um, what do I have? Now? Oh yeah. So um, uh, a month later he had a, a cerebral hemorrhage and in Munich and had to have an emergency surgery. Um, the result of that, um, I mean immediately after the, um, immediately after the assault, um, he posted a photograph, I should, yeah there we go, he posted that photograph that's him with one of the officers in an elevator. Um, the, the day that that happened. Um, and uh, this is an image of um, his scan after, uh, before or after the surgery. Um, these were also things that Ai Weiwei put online, um, specifically, you know, um, photographs of him with a tube with his own blood and, and some message with the badge number for the officer who apparently hit him. Pretty serious. Now, you, in, in flashing through some of the images, because I want to come back to his interaction with the Chinese government, sure. but, but I think one really powerful piece in talking about the earthquake was the, the rebar piece, the straight piece, and I don't know yes. if it's possible, just briefly to flash back to that, sure, because I yeah, think that's absolutely. worth noting. Yeah. Um, this piece is called Straight. I can't remember right now how many tons of rebar that is. Um, they, the rebar came directly from the site of the earthquake and um, uh, it was a mangled mess. Um, Ai Weiwei had it shipped back to his studio and for a while it was there in that form and as sort of a testament to what had happened um, at, in the Sichuan province. But um, eventually over time um, he had each of those bars straightened with heat 
um, and it's sort of a, a statement about um, about how how the he, he definitely perceived that the Chinese government sought to sanitize what had happened and that was why they were hiding the names sort of wanting to move on to better times without acknowledgement of, of what wrong had happened in the midst of this event. And, and so Rachel, you talked about the, the 2009 incident and while he's had a number of interactions, I think there are a few significant ones. So we had this incident in 2009 where he was trapped in the hotel and maybe talk a little bit about what happened to him sort of several years later as this work continued to progress. Right. Well, so did the event in the hotel room, did that assault slow him down or quiet him down? No. No. Um, and so it was this, it, it's since then, it's been a lot of um, very, I mean, really, um, the events um, surrounding the earthquake and his work with that has elevated his, Ai Weiwei had been known as an artist in America and in other countries, but in China, it was the work that he did related to the earthquake that really made him better known to the public, um, the Chinese public. Um, and um, that positioning um, was, I think, really, really vexing to the Chinese government. Um, and constant back and forth. He uh, at one point described his relationship with the Chinese government as a chess game um, in which he was waiting for the next move. So um, this sort of came to a head um, uh, in 2011. Um, Ai Weiwei just seemed to disappear. Um, and it was later uh, determined that he had been taken into custody and uh, he uh, was detained for 81 days. Um, during that time, there was a guard with him at all times. And um, he also um, was just constantly badgered about um, his online activity and interviews that he had had with the media. Um, he was eventually released and uh, they claimed that there had been some um, tax evasion issue. Um, yeah, so he's back out in the world now, but it was um, remarkable. And the, you know, the, a big part of his being released when he was probably was about the international uproar that happened as the result of his confinement. Um, um, it, it was an international movement to get him released. And so he's been moving with complete freedom and autonomy since then and... Not at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I mean, for example, we would have loved to have had him here for the opening, um, but his um, passport was taken and, um, yeah, his, his travel is, is very, 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 very restricted. So this is the point when I look at Ken and I say, but that could never, ever happen here. <laughs> well. The thing about art, of course, uh, as expression, and obviously art is covered by the First Amendment, which covers our freedom of speech, but obviously speech is much more than that. And the thing about art as expression is it's subversive. It's subversive in the sense that, as opposed to a narrative which says, vote for me, art can be interpreted, it can be thought of differently, and it can arouse passions long after the artist has left the scene while you're still viewing his or her work. And we have seen many cases in the United States where government is offended by art and tries to suppress art. Um, obviously, what happens in China in terms of suppression uh, is, is greatly uh, magnified over the United States experience. But it's a mistake to think that Artists are free in the United States to post whatever they want, wherever they want. Uh, and the cases that have arisen, there are a number of them in the recent past. Uh, you, have, you had Mayor Giuliani trying to evict the Brooklyn Museum of Art from its premises because he objected to an exhibition uh, that he felt was sacrilegious. Uh, you had... Uh, Alderman in Chicago, 
ripping down and trying to, to steal and deface a painting of the late Mayor Harold Washington. Um, you had a, a, an artist here in Indianapolis who was commissioned to um, create a sculpture uh, that uh, commemorated the black experience, African American experience, which created a great deal of resentment and was never completed. So uh, we do not put people in jail in the United States uh, because of their art generally. However, <coughs> Government is sometimes highly offended and has to be reminded that artists, like authors, like all of us, have First Amendment rights. So to say it can't happen here, certainly to, not to that degree, but the, the vigilance that is necessary when you're dealing with expression uh, extends to all expression and especially to art. And, and there are many examples throughout our both recent and our lengthy past of situations where artists have had their work suppressed because of the fact that people did not like their ideas. Now you hit on a couple interesting instances and Ken and I spoke on the phone earlier this week kind of leading up to this conversation and he... We prepped in everything. So this is all choreographed. But we were talking back and forth and some of the things he referenced I was familiar with, the, the incident at the Brooklyn Museum I was aware of, but this, this incident in Chicago um, I wasn't aware of and I did a little research and reading today and I I find it such a fascinating example because it, it seems that the, and what was an official government reaction was so yes. extreme and clear. Like it, it seemed like, while certainly people felt justified, the, the closest thing I've seen to some of the Ai Weiwei experiences with sure. people storming in and ripping art off the wall and being impounded by police. Well, so it's, you know, and, and that I think speaks to the, the strength of art as opposed to other media because I, I, I was listening to NPR because I work for the ACLU so I have to listen to NPR. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, they were talking about the, the 100th year anniversary of the Rite of Spring, Stravinsky's work, where there was riots. There were riots. And I was thinking, well, that's bizarre. I mean, who would riot over, you know, whatever? And then I was thinking about the experience, and, and again, just the case we were alluding to in Chicago, there was a mayor, a mayor Washington, of course, the first African mayor of Chicago after he died. There was a tremendously unflattering, I guess I would be charitable and say, there's a tremendously unflattering portrait of him, uh, such that some of his former supporters actually tried to seize it and did seize it and ended up getting sued for damages for destroying art. And, and, and it really speaks to the fact that art excites things uh, and that also speaks to the beauty of something we have that unfortunately China does not have, which is the First Amendment. Because all the cases I mentioned are cases where, where courts eventually said, you cannot do that. You cannot suppress someone's ideas in that way. Uh, and, and that's something um, that is incredibly important. And we tend to forget the type of freedom that it gives to artists. Uh, and I think this is a very good reminder of what happens when it's not there. Well, I think that some of your comments on the, the power of art as an emotionally evocative form of speech uh, is a good segue into some of the, the work that LaShonda has done. And so I think now I've got a few questions for you, but I think in order to really give it context, mm -hmm. if you could maybe talk a little bit about some of your work and the, the Lynch Quilts project in particular, to kind of set the stage for okay. well, what Kim was talking about. Well, I have to make a comment, because in the U.S. we might not have government storming, but what we do have is our kind of censor are actually the communities that we live in, and they're really great about attacking people and smear campaigns. They're really great about the keep in mind our media is only owned by three or four different corporations, and if they don't want what you have to say out, they make sure it doesn't get out. So we might not have a government censor, but we do have public censors that are very strong and active in regards to trying to support us uh, voice, uh, whether it's book burners or it's people who just won't give you grants. or it's, it's, So it's still out there. It's just morphs because we're in a different society. So we should just kind of keep that in mind. In regards to my particular project, of course, I always hit resistance because who really wants to see me show up and say, hey, let's talk about lynching. We just, no one wants to see me coming. <laughs> Trust me, they just don't want to see me coming. 
Uh, and they definitely don't want me to come and smile and talk about it and say, let's talk about all the stuff that we want to sweep under the rug. And I'm like, no, I'm going to pull it out the closet and I'm going to, all the pain, shame, everything that you have attached to that history, I'm going to put it on tape and we're going to talk about it. And they definitely don't like to see me come and do that. And so what I actually have to do to kind of shield myself from those sensors is build community along the way. So, for example, I uh, work with this project with a woman in Oregon, and of course I don't fly back and forth to Oregon because it's 3,000 miles. So we spend very long conversations in Skype trying to get her prepared to present this project in a community that is probably like 99.9% .9 white, a city that was founded by the Ku Klux Klan, a city that uh, this was probably about five years ago where they actually had to fight to make them take down the... Uh, the, they had a huge ceremony to talk about, let's put a plaque up for our city founders, and when everyone realized they were honoring the Klan, and this is a town of probably about 6,000 people, they had to fight them for about three to four months to make them remove this plaque, because then you find out it's the mayor's wife who's put it up there, so then what does that say? And uh, so she was kind of the leader of fighting to get this taken down. And it kind of started because she was like, well, if you, if you can kind of go out there and do your project, I, I think I could do this. And so fast forward nine till two years ago when we started to put, bring the lynch quilt to this community. And uh, but the thing I tried to prepare her for was like, I can teach you the history and I can give you strategies, but what you're going to encounter is really all that emotional rage, that pain, and that's the thing that you are not prepared for until you encounter it. And so the first time, uh, we called that project Performing the Lynch Quilt Projects, and she just went and got permission to go to the little county fair, which was ran by uh, a, what do you call it, a Catholic charity. And so she went, and she was just passing out flyers, just trying to talk about the project. And when I got up that morning, I had a seven-page email saying, please read this. When you wake up, I hope that you're reading this, because if I wake up, I can't, and I don't have a response from you, I cannot go back out to that fair today. So, of course, thank God for the three-hour difference, because when she got up, she probably had like a six-page response to her seven-page response. And she was like, I know that you're laughing because you tried to warn me and there is no preparation. And there really isn't because think about how many of you have cringed when you walked through the door and saw the quilt or even the fact that I'm just up here talking about lynching. So if we talk about lynching, how many of you actually can be honest that you know the history of lynching or even know what that is? Is that not a form of, see, one, two, three, four, five, I've seen probably maybe a do couple dozen hands. How many of you have actually taught about it in school? That's very rare because they don't really teach it. In the state of Indiana, when we get to the Ku Klux Klan, it's a one paragraph in the fourth grade. Can you really have a discussion about what racial oppression means and what it really means when it's translated into action in the fourth grade? But this is our education. So when I have the project, I run into a lot of people who are just like, I just had no idea so this was American history. And I'm like, well, now you do. So here we go. And then we have a long list. <laughs> And I think what's even sadder is that I run into more foreign-born Americans who have more knowledge of this history than people who are actually from America. And then there are those who have their um, kind of golden bubble of what America is when that bubble gets popped and I have to start telling the whole history, then I pull out the books, then I pull out the more images. And, um, but it's just what must be done. And some people are like, well, how can you tell me that's a healing project? And I always say, well, you know, if you got in a car accident and broke your leg, no one told you that that was going to feel good while you got it fixed and had to get it set. So I don't know why we would think historical and emotional traumas that impact us generation after generation wouldn't be just as painful when we had to go through the process of healing those. So um, for me, I became an urban farmer because I needed to balance the death with the way to have life in my life. <laughs> because if you read these accounts over and over again, they're not... Uh, they're not nice to say it's so kind of localizing what you were saying before mm -hmm. and connecting to what Kim was saying about the maybe underappreciated power of visual arts as a, as a form of speech and a form of dissent and even a form of healing I know that you you ran the quilts here in the public library and mm -hmm. when, when you and I spoke we went through some of the reactions there and it was interesting to see how that sort of ran the gamut of mm -hmm interaction and emotion and so I'd be curious for you to talk a little bit with folks about what that drew out of people here in Indianapolis. 
Uh, well, I think probably just in this audience, it's probably drawing out some pain, some shame, some anger. Uh, it ran the gamut of human emotions. Uh, I, a part of the project is not to just kind of drop it, but to actually try to drop it within context. So we had all types of resources up there at the library. I think we had probably six different flyers that discussed the project, the history, resources on how to connect with community building and racial healing projects, not only just in Indianapolis, but nationally, where to go to get training in Indianapolis for this. We also had a response box, and the library put up a uh, series of books that talked about this history so that people would not just kind of, which what typically happens with this type of art, you kind of point, and then you don't give people a place to go. So we really want to make sure that even though we were pointing, we were still pointing you in a better direction if you wanted to go there. And I went uh, two to three times a week for a couple of hours each time just to sit if people wanted to talk and to in many ways give the library a reprieve because think about it. Here's the quilt. Here's the information desk. Who are they going to? Information desk. They're going over there. And so uh, I would just come and people would wait for me. I had one nemesis who met me all 23 times that I came to the library. <laughs> Uh, I just could not believe it. I would come different days, different times, and he was waiting. So <laughs> I figured this was my challenge because you don't get to poke the tiger and then cry foul when it turns around and bites you. And I had even went there to teach a couple of classes to art history classes where I was there, and he was there. I was like, it's 7 o'clock at night. How are you in the library waiting on me? But there he was, and we just had our continual conversation, and he was enraged and angry, and I'd be like, well, hopefully one day you'll see that this is important, and we would agree and disagree, and it went like that in all times. So I'll be interested to see where this goes, and this may connect to some audience questions. Um, as I set this up, I think it's important to acknowledge the distinctions between what we saw with Ai Weiwei and some of the cases you talked about, where we've got government stepping in and stopping a project. But Ken, you referenced the Fred Wilson sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that locally, if we're going to talk about visual arts as a form of evocative expression, trying to start a dialogue, that's certainly our most recent local example and, and how that's become prominent. And so I'm not going to frame it with any more detail, but I would love to throw out a reaction from any one of the three of you about how that process came to be and what that says about visual art and visual art that challenges here in Indianapolis and process and so I've thrown a whole bunch of different stuff and allowed you guys to go with it but I I think we would be remiss to not touch on it here because it's a a really relevant local topic does everyone know what we're talking about? so does somebody else want to give background or I can give my... You want to give the background? So, should you. Be, you. <laughs> so I'm sure I will do it injustice, but um, there was a public art project that um, I think largely driven by the folks at CICF to create a sculpture here in Indianapolis that I believe is going to be displayed close to the city county building. Mm -hmm. And the artist Fred Wilson took a character from the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on the Circle, an African-American character, and wanted to pull him out and have him as sort of a singular character, the slave character that's sort of reaching up in the larger context of characters that's in this monument, and bring him out individually, and, and that character would be placed out in the same position he is in that monument, but holding a flag and drawn out separately to draw attention to that character. Um, and as that process went forward, there were some really strong emotions, particularly from folks in the African-American community who were, and, and I apologize greatly if I'm mischaracterizing because it's hard to generalize lots of people's reaction, but were upset that the chosen, enraged, that the chosen image for one of the most high-profile public art projects dealing with African-Americans in the city would deal with an African-American slave, and that there were other images that they wanted to see brought forth first, and there was a long process and discussion on that. Ultimately, the project didn't happen. So, But it did happen. And see, that's what people have to understand. Fred Wilson's work is not about making sculptures, and that may be, be where the project process itself kind of failed. 
uh, because Fred Wilson is not a sculptor. Fred Wilson, in many ways, is an artist who uses art as a vehicle to create dialogue about difficult subjects. He is known primarily in the world for a project that's called uh, Mining the Museum, where he goes into the museum and pulls out all the little dirty secrets in the back. So when he did this in Baltimore, so you would see that here's this wonderful ornate carved chair from the 1700s, and then he put the slave whipping post that was made with it right next to it so that you would have a context of what that history is. So then you'd go over here and you'd see, because uh, there used to be this whole history of putting a slave in the painting of the family portrait. It's just really odd. And they're always little kids. And so you would walk up to the painting, and the painting would start talking, where's my mommy? I miss my mommy. And so it made people have to rethink, like, what are these images that are you seeing, and what is actually hid in the back of the museum? So the one that probably most people found offensive was he actually had a baby carriage and had uh, a uh, Ku Klux Klan outfit that had been made for a baby and they had been made in the same time and the Ku Klux Klan baby outfit was in the baby carriage. So for someone who does that to create dialogue, to me the project happened because the project created a dialogue in Indianapolis that I bet everybody in Indianapolis, at least in the art community, knows where that slave is on that monument and that is the real artwork, not whether or not we actually got a sculpture out of it, but it's actually the dialogue that occurred, which is the real artwork. At least that's my perspective, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I think it illustrates the subversive nature of art, the, the fact that, that whatever people's intentions are sometimes the perception goes beyond that, and uh, which is why art is so powerful as, as a form of expression. Um, a narrative describing exactly what you just described uh, and describing the artwork as you described it would not be one one hundredth as powerful as the visualization that people had and the, and the ideas that that promoted. So I, I, again, um, art, is, art is expression and um, Nothing that happened in that experience is, is bad or is unconstitutional. There was, the government did not get involved. It was, a, it was being privately funded and, and the artists decided and everyone decided to, to move in different directions. But it, it demonstrates uh, how uh, incredibly powerful art can be. Now, I, I feel like this discussion about, we've sort of made the assumption here as a group and collectively that art is speech, and, and I think amongst this group that may be an obvious statement, but I think amongst others this notion that a painting or a sculpture is protected First Amendment speech sure. could be slightly abstract, and so I don't know, Ken, if you can talk about the court's perspective sure. on sure. drawing that line on what is I can, speech and I what can, isn't. I can do that. Uh, I, I thought so you might. Not so good in the art department, but in the law department I, I get better. Uh, the First Amendment this is our freedom of speech, but the Supreme Court and courts have recognized from quite early on that speech includes all of our expressive behavior. It can include um, actions, burning a flag is speech, actions that we perceive as expression. It can include, obviously, our writings. It can include abstract expression like art. Um, because these are communicative. Uh, and our, our founders recognized that we communicate in many, many ways besides just writing pamphlets or, or talking uh, in, in a political sense. And so there's no doubt, there's no court in the country that would not recognize a, a piece of art as, as a expression and would hopefully protect it in the same way that we protect our right to, to speak. Which is why when you have government attempting to censor, either directly or, or indirectly, um, that's a very pernicious thing. Uh, the, the beauty of the First Amendment, and the reason it's, it's so important, after all it's first, uh, is that it allows everyone to have a voice. And if the Chinese experience is, is anything to contrast, 
it reminds us what happens when people don't have voices. A and, and you mentioned the, the KKK. Um, Justice Douglas, uh, the late Supreme Court Justice, was very fond of talking about bad ideas uh, being sort of like mushrooms. That if we, if we don't expose groups like the Klan or, 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 or hate groups to the light of day, if we don't make them go out into the public and express themselves so we can reject them publicly, then their ideas will, will grow like mushrooms do in the dark. Uh, and the purpose of the First Amendment is to let all ideas, not even, not great ideas, not always wonderful ideas, not ideas that I would particularly like, um, but to let all ideas be expressed and then have the dialogue. And if we reject the ideas, then they're rejected um, and we move on to other ideas. But the idea that government would ever step in and prevent any idea from being heard means that uh, government is in some way contributing to making ideas go underground where they'll fester and as opposed to being exposed to the light of day where they will either wither and die or, or they'll be accepted and we'll move on. To connect some of what we talked about early with Ai Weiwei, with Rachel, to some of the ideas that LaShonda brought out that really the, uh, in America, the, the censor is not necessarily the government agent coming to shut down your show, but is not well-managed community groups and not well-engaged community groups. And that's where we see things stop. And I, and I apologize to put you on the spot, Rachel, because I know this could be a, the question I'm about to ask you is a tricky thing to acquire knowledge on, so we may not have an answer. But I'm curious if you've come across anything that talks about not Ai Weiwei's interaction with the government, but with the Chinese people. If there's been sort of known resistance to his work and and I understand knowing the popular opinions of the Chinese people on uh, challenging critiques of the government isn't something that's easy to acquire, but I'm curious if that's come across in any of your readings. Um, well, you know, most of uh, the material that I read was focused on Ai Weiwei, of course. So I um, definitely heard about some interactions and about... Um, yeah, um, okay, it, it, yeah, so it's just that I, I, I can't propose an opposite sort of side of things, but yes, many interesting examples. So when he went to um, Chengdu to support that other activist, um, they, he and his, and the other uh, volunteers um, uh, went uh, to this restaurant and people heard that he was there and showed up and were just excited to see him and to photograph him and say hello. But that's dangerous, you know? Um, uh, every, Ai Weiwei's every move um, now is, is basically under surveillance. Um, there are people outside his studio all the time. Um, that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, Beautiful piece of marble. Yes, yes. And the surveillance camera is a really prominent part of, of his life now. Um, but, but yes, I mean, there are people um, who uh, have um, loved the opportunity to, um, in some quiet way, to express support for what Ai Weiwei is trying to do in China. Um, another thing that is sort of interesting um, Every year at the Chinese New Year, he produces um, this um, Ai Weiwei-ified sort of um, uh, drawing that he makes available online. Um, you can print it out and put it on your door. There's this Chinese custom with, um, I think it's called, they're called the door gods. Um, but in this version, um, it's a, a sort of a spin-off with a lot of the trappings of the work that Ai Weiwei does. And Maybe someone just enjoys having that on their uh, desktop, if they were even able to access it, by the way, you know. Um, or if they were really bold, they could put it on their doors. But again, that would be um, a risky act. Yeah. Well, with that, it seems like we've got a pretty active crowd. And so at this point, I would love to open it up to... Uh, folks that have maybe more interesting questions than I do. So if you uh, 
Yes, sir. Yes. That happens all the time. Um, um, I'm trying to think of a recent example. Um, since I can't think of one, I'll just tell you that we're right now working on um, a really exciting exhibition of Matisse's work. And um, what's provocative or questionable about that, but there will be a gallery of nudes, and it is a real question about, you know, real, I know, I know, I know, but it's something that we, you know, that, that we will get some response about that will happen. Um, yeah, there's another um, new uh, photograph um, in uh, the graphite exhibition that we also got some public response to. Yeah. Down front. Is it a stretch to say that Michael Moore is America's highway way? Ah, that's interesting. I, I think there are a lot of people out there who perform a necessary and important function. And I think the great thing about America and the great thing about the First Amendment is we don't have to say this artist or that artist, because I think the mere fact that people have the possibility is, is, is what's significant. And uh, you know, the First Amendment is a marvelously apolitical thing. It, it protects everyone regardless of their political thoughts and their views. And um, I don't think we spend enough time being thankful for it and being thankful for the ability to have a Michael Moore and being able to thank for the ability to turn Michael Moore off if we want to turn him <laughs> off. Um, and that's, that's unique. That really is unique. I mean, there are not, you know, there are not a lot of countries with a Bill of Rights that, is, that sets out in a way that is permanent and cannot be compromised. Now, we might not always like the way courts interpret the First Amendment. We might not always like certain aspects of it. But the idea that we have a system founded as many years ago as it was that guarantees us this right and guarantees us the right to say and to, to produce and to... Um, inform the way we want is, is fairly remarkable. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the First Amendment. And then there was, yes. Jim in the black shirt. I think that's a canned question. The, um, there is private and there is public. If the government hands over responsibilities to a private entity, if the government says, look, private company, you run this prison, then the prison is required to comply with the Bill of Rights because it's performing a public function. What, um, what is a more difficult question, which is what you touched on, is, is the government can take a completely neutral view of a project, but if you can't get funding for it, if, if, it is, um, if the community decides that we don't want to hear this and we don't want to pay for it, uh, when you're doing uh, large-scale art projects, that could be I I incredibly difficult. And that's, and that's censorship, which unfortunately the First Amendment doesn't reach, but it's, it's no less significant. And it's not, it's not because this is something we have a society, has decided we don't want to hear in the way we may say we don't want to hear from the Klan. It may be, as you said, it's something that we don't want to hear because we don't want to think about it. And the role of the artist is to make you think about it. And, and, that's, and that's a subversive uh, nature of art. 
all the way in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's um I think that's the beautiful thing about him. He loves China. He really does. Um he wants to see things get better. Um surely, but he's really committed to the cause. Um he I I've never heard of um any uh any reference to him even considering leaving China. Yeah. He when he um he lived in America for 10 years. Um most of it was in New York and he um when at the time that he left China to go to New York, he told his father that he was going home. And in New York, um Ai Weiwei witnessed things that really inspired him and you know, I think set him up to really be on fire about freedom of expression. So um you know but he's he's devoted he'll stay. The gentleman in the check shirt. I'm glad to hear the comment made that um he he purposed you and Fred Wilson uh that uh, government suppression was not involved in that. Um uh, and uh during that process they had uh, Dr. Kirk Savage from the University of Pittsburgh uh come out and and uh, talk to the community and he said you know public art especially memorials and monuments always controversial. So to me the takeaway on that was our lack of a public process related to public art that gave the community the opportunity to to you know the constructive opportunity to weigh in pro and con uh in terms of what goes in public spaces. And I think that that's probably a Lashonda question because I know that you've wrestled with that more than any of us for sure. Yes and no, but I I think I'm not trying to throw anybody in the bus, but there there is just probably from my perspective that what they did was the way that the art world works. But once you choose to kind of touch hot button issues, and you have to be honest, you talk about race, you talk about abortion, you talk about any of those topics that make people go crazy, then you have to know that you have to have other skills at the table and look at addressing these issues not from the point of view that this is how we do it in the art world. You really have to go back to those community organizing skills like how do we build community? So, uh one example is uh the there's a traveling show and just shameless plug you should all try to bring it here. It's called Without Sanctuary. And what it is is an actual exhibition of lynching postcards and the, there's a book about it and but the one thing that they do is that a year before that exhibition exhibition even gets here they start the community building process period cuz their whole thing is that it's not like we're not going to bring it here we're bringing it we're just preparing you we're just kind of preparing the way for the community to be able to not just view the work be able to grow from the work when i was in atlanta i've seen this show 3 times at this point when i was living in atlanta it came and at the time i didn't really get it but i get it now and this was 10 years ago the initial public discussions were divided by race so you had to go in the black day in the black room you had to go in the white day in the white room if you were other you went on the other day in the other room <laughs> don't try to cross lines cuz they're not playing that game and the reality is is that people would not be honest about how they felt if they were in a crowd where they felt they were being judged and so in the beginning you have to go back to community building principles if you're going to bring something like this Dr. Erica Doss who's the head of the American Studies Department over at Notre Dame has an entire book be called Memorial Nation and she goes through and tracks how and why when memorials are successful Uh Duluth Minnesota actually has the largest lynching memorial in the entire country but they started that process through the community building process long before they actually got to turning this entire plaza into a memorial about lynching bringing lynching education into their public schools they had an entire process where they went slow and you can't adhere to timelines because timelines are easy and this is how we do it in the art world you have to adhere to the community building principles which are go slow you have to do extensive reach out all the time until you really feel like that you're getting the voice of the community 
So there's different ways to do it, and my perception is you touch a hot button issue, where there's art, where whatever you're doing, you better go back to community building principles, or what is going to happen is you're going to throw a match into a, basically a gasoline tank. So I've been told we have two more questions. Um, two more minutes, which probably means one more question, but I'll say before I dangerously select which question is that all the folks that are up here will stick around for a little bit and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk afterwards. Um, I'm going to go with this gentleman only because he was most enthusiastic with his hand raising. <laughs> I don't think I'll be in a situation anytime soon where I'll be able to make the decision as to what the law should be. I think I'm sort of stuck with what the law is, and you're right. Um, the Supreme Court has struggled with the First Amendment rights of public employees, um, and has, and there's certainly uh, certain employees who do not have the right to speak, and that is a balance which the court has attempted to strike, and all we can do is try and interpret the law uh, and and push for remedies when there are particularly egregious situations. I mean, you know, Daniel Ellsberg, um, and the fact that many of you here were not born when Daniel Ellsberg <laughs> is one of the most depressing things that happened to me today, but um, <laughs> was a public employee who obviously the Supreme Court recognized could speak and, and obviously had to speak. Uh, and we have other lessons going the other way and we just have to struggle with that on a case by case basis. But we're doing it against the backdrop of the First Amendment, so at least we have a backdrop of the First Amendment. All right, I've been given the official time cue, but I wanna thank all of you guys first for coming out and being part of a really great conversation. And I also want to thank Jane and all the great people at the ACLU, Preston and, and Rachel and all the great people here at the IMA, and LaShonda and Ken, and we'll all stick around for a bit. Thank you guys. <laughs>